Today, I am distilling a bourbon wash. I'm taking it all the way from fermenter through to a product that is ready to drink. So if you're new to distilling, or perhaps you just kind of want to brush up on the basics of distilling a bourbon or a corn-based whiskey, this is the video for you. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and today I'm doing a little bit more of a back-to-basics video on the actual distilling process. I know often this part in uh, the standard videos where I, you know, do a different recipe or, um, you know, play with a different ingredient gets brushed over, and that is often because I assume that the people that are watching this channel regularly have probably got a pretty good understanding of the basics and I don't have to go into that every single time. In any case, I have a wash here ready to go. And speaking of watching other YouTube videos, the first thing you should do, if you're not sure how to make a wash like this, is go back and watch a different video on Claw Hammer Supplies channel. This is a collaboration, guys. Uh, I was in America a little while ago. I got to hang out with the team from Claw Hammer and they were absolutely awesome. A whole bunch of fun to hang out with uh, and we together made a video making this wash. I made it exactly the same way uh, as I made it with Emma and Kyle from Clawhammer. The only difference is that I sparged at the end of the process which means I've got a little bit more volume and a slightly lower ABV. All of that to say if you want to know how to actually have a wash ready to distill so you can actually make a bourbon beginning to end go and watch that video. Uh, with me hanging out with the guys at Claw Hammer and then come back here to figure out how to distill it. Of course guys, there's going to be links in the description down below. With all of that said, let's get stuck into step number one, which is actually to figure out whether or not your wash has fully fermented or not, and this often gets looked over. So why are we doing this? Well, we want to know that the wash has fermented out dry, and already I've hit a uh, I guess like a colloquialism, a inward for distilling that is going to start driving the new distiller mad. It's pretty basic, it just means that all of the sugar that can be fermented has been fermented, so it's no longer sweet. We're getting as much conversion from sugar to alcohol as we can, um, so we're going to be able to make as much product as we can later on. And we're going to start out super basic here, guys. The, the, the first way to know if this has happened is just to look at the wash. You're looking to see that the wash is no longer uh, turbid and sort of turning over and actively bubbling. You may get a little bit of fizzing every now and again, that's fine, that's just um, CO2 off-gassing. But what you don't want to see is it actively turning over and you definitely don't want to see a croisin on top. We've heard another word, croisin. Um, a bunch of uh, foamy, goopy looking crap <laughs> on top of your fermenter. Uh, you can also, at this point in time, give it a little taste, as long as you're pretty sure that nothing too funky is growing in there. Uh, and it should taste uh, thin and slightly sour. If you don't have any other tools, that's fine. Just look at it, smell it, taste it. You're probably good. Uh, but for a few bucks you can get one of these and this is a hydrometer. Uh, this essentially all it does is, is measure the, the density of a liquid you put it in uh, and dissolving a buttload of sugar into a liquid increases its density significantly. Uh, so at the beginning of a fermentation it might be up somewhere around here like um, 1065, 1070, something like that. But as that sugar is consumed by the yeast and turned into alcohol, the density of the liquid is going to drop significantly. Uh, so one of these placed into the liquid. So a wash like this I'm expecting to ferment out dry. Like we said earlier that just means there's no sugar left in it. So the Density of the liquid is going to be the same or actually even slightly lower than water. In other words, this is going to read very close to one. Just be aware guys that there is stuff like, um, what's an example here, uh, rum, molasses. There's a bunch of unfermentable sugars in a lot of molasses. Uh, so you might have a final gravity of like 1035, that's totally normal. Uh, and of course you can go to, you know, the flash guy option of something like this. This is an easy dense. It essentially does the same thing as the hydrometer. It just lets you read the, the numbers on your phone and it's easy to use and kind of makes you feel badass. <laughs> They're pretty cool, but they are not cheap. 
you can also use one of these guys. It's a refractometer, but there is a trap here. Uh, you can use this to find your final gravity, but you can only do so if you know exactly what your uh, starting gravity was. The starting gravity is the gravity reading that you should have taken uh, at the beginning of fermentation. That would have been uh, covered in the other video with Claw Hammer Supply. But you have to know the original gravity and you have to do a little bit of maths or plug it into a calculator. So just be aware if you're getting very strange readings with this thing, that's why. <laughs> you can also do a skull test. If you haven't heard of the skull test, uh, you're gonna need a few mils of your sample and you're gonna need a skull as well. And the key is to put a few drips right here on the horn. It's gonna tell you absolutely nothing about your sample, but it is a sweet segue into today's sponsor, Skull Bliss. Skull Bliss hand carve these awesome designs into uh, ram, cow, buffalo, or longhorn skulls. And you guessed it, they have a giant sale on right now. I've got a longhorn skull with a metallic finish and I have to say it looks absolutely freaking amazing. I'm gonna hang it right over there. But honestly, these things are very cool guys uh, and they have a giant range of different skulls, finishes and carving patterns to fit whatever taste you have. They also even have uh, lamp wall mounts to put a light in behind them, which I didn't get and I kind of regret that now because having light coming through all those details would look pretty freaking dope. Anyway, like I said, they have a crazy sale on right now. In fact, it is the best time of year to pick up one of these skulls. So use the code in the description down below to go on over to their website and pick out your own premium handcraft skull today. At this point, you're probably starting to get the idea that this is going to be a rather long, rather detailed video helping uh, new distillers get into the game, get into the craft of home distillation. So if that's you, awesome. Keep watching, you're gonna love this video. It's gonna give you a lot of the information you need to get started or to up your game slightly if you're a new distiller as well. Uh, if you're just here to kind of see some interesting, entertaining content about how you make spirits, I totally get it. That's awesome. This may not be the video for you. I'll drop some links in the description down below for more of what you're after. I'd suggest probably the 1700s historic absinthe or the Peaky Blinders gin. Links down there. So let's assume that our wash has fermented out completely dry. In a nice case, it has. It's sitting down just below one. Uh, and it's time to distill it. But first, we need to decide what still we're going to use, what kind of still we should use for this. And this is a bit tricky, team, because there's no real right answer. There's different ways of going about this. But in the hobby or home distilling world, for making a whiskey or a bourbon, you've got two main options. One is to double pot still. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, or the second is to use some plates. This is a bubble plate. And spoiler alert, we're not using these today. We'll be making another video in a little while talking about this kind of distillation. But essentially you stack these, bang, 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 in the column uh, and they force extra interaction between uh, the liquid and the vapor, which is going to force or encourage or push, however you want to describe it, the ABV of your final product way up. Like I said, we're not using these today. We're gonna to focus on pot distillation and I'm gonna tell you why. This is a pot still, and a pot still by almost definition of what a pot still is, is relatively simple distillation. This is all we need for a pot still, and this sits on top of the pot. All of the wash is gonna go in here, and it is going to be heated up until it starts to boil. The vapor is gonna come up through here, and it's gonna go up through a column. Some pot stills have an onion, a dome, um, like a big ball. There's all sorts of different shapes, but essentially all of those things do the same thing, which is uh, direct the vapor up to the line arm, the line arm directs the vapor over into the condenser. The condenser cools the vapor back into liquid, and then we collect the, uh, the liquid, the, the distillate, down here off the end of the spout. So as far as distillation goes, this is about as basic as it can get. Why are we doing it this way, when we can use, you know, like, more complex methods? Uh, the long and the short of it is, team, is that distillation is basically the art or the science or the alchemy of separating 
different chemicals out into different fractions and then choosing which of those fractions you want to keep. And the more you move away from simple pot distillation, generally, the less flavour you're going to end up with at the end, all things being equal. Some people like a lighter bourbon, you know, heading more towards a, a Tennessee style whiskey. Not me. I like a bourbon with a buttload of flavour. I like it to have a big, thick, chewy, um, voluptuous, velvety mouthfeel. And I like it to actually taste <laughs> like the ingredients that we put into our wash. That is why we're going to be using pot distillation. Uh, but there is an issue with pot distillation, and that is that every time you run the still, the ABV that you're going to get coming over here is directly related to the ABV that goes into the pot. So why does that matter for us with pot distillation? Uh, it matters because essentially we cannot get this up to a high enough ABV in large enough quantities to matter to put into a barrel or age on oak at a high enough ABV to make bourbon. It's just not gonna happen. So we are going to have to double distill it. That's why we call it double pot distillation. So the first thing we're gonna do is get stuck into our stripping runs. Don't worry, I'm gonna explain what that is in a minute. But for now, all you need to know is that we need to charge this still, just tip some of the wash into the still. <laughs> uh, and it's very important that we don't overfill it. So I'm gonna aim for about here on the still. Now, you'll notice that there is a bunch of chunky, goopy stuff sitting in the bottom. And you'll notice that I haven't put that into the still. Uh, this is our yeast. And when it's finished doing its job, it's going to flocculate, which essentially means uh, it's going to drop out of suspension in the liquid and settle out down at the bottom, uh, hoping and waiting and praying that more sugar is going to come along for it. <laughs> in this case, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to put that into the still, we don't need it in there, and depending on the type of yeast that you're using, it can actually give some pretty seriously bad off flavours, so we're not going to use that. So after tipping that first bucket in, our level is right around here, uh, I'm going to top it up a little bit more, but like I said earlier, we do not want to push this too high, and the reason for that is that we do not want our still to, here comes another one of those words, puke. What is puking, you most likely ask? Well, as we heat this up uh, to eventually get it to boil and get the vapour to come off so we can move it through the still and condense it and collect it, this liquid is going to start to foam. And if there is not enough room here to accommodate for that foam, that foam is going to build up in the still uh, and it's going to start moving higher and higher. The foam level is going to move higher and higher until it gets condensed and forced down into this tiny little space here. Uh, and when it does so, it's just going to go shoot straight up and pour over the top. In effect, what that means is that we're just getting straight liquid that hasn't actually been distilled, forced through our still and come out the end. Now, to be honest, on a stripping run, it's not that big of a deal. But it does mean that we're going to have to do a whole bunch of cleaning later on. <laughs> you don't want to leave all of that gunk stuck in your still. You're going to know if it's happened because uh, liquid that is the same colour as the wash is going to be coming out of here and it's going to come out a whole lot faster. If it does happen, just turn the power off, let it sit for a while, start again. We do have one other little tool to help ensure that we don't get one of those dreaded pukes and that is to use something to basically mess with the surface tension of the liquid and uh, stop the bubbles from, I guess it's more stop the bubbles from forming and also help them pop easier, uh, and that is to use a little bit of butter. You can also buy um, anti-foam, which to be honest actually works a little bit better, but I'm guessing you've got butter <laughs> at home. So drop a little bit of that in there and that's going to help a whole lot. Anyway, it's time for me to move this over there next to the sink, uh, because we are going to need running water. All right, our still is filled up and it is starting to warm up now. It's plugged in, it's turned on. Uh, and while this is a, a, a awesome and safe hobby, there are a few things that we need to take seriously about it. And it's just stuff that you're gonna do every single time you need to make a habit of it. 
So the still's on, it's warming up. First thing is to ensure that the still is put together correctly. Uh, with the claw hammer set up, this is pretty easy. Everything's put together with tri-clamps. I'm just gonna ensure that everything is in fact tightened up because we don't want any leaks anywhere. And the second thing is just to make sure that the area is suitable for operation. I'll be honest with you guys, with the camera gear especially, I'm kind of bad at this. So, you know, learn from my mistakes. If you've seen past videos recently, you probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, make sure there's no tripping hazards, make sure we've got enough room to work, make sure nothing's gonna fall on it or move into it and knock it over. You know, the, the, the sort of thing that would make sense for a, a barbecue or operating a wok. <laughs> And we also just wanna make sure that our cooling is going to work the way we expect it to work. So with this, once again, it's a very simple setup. All we're doing is running uh, coolant into the bottom of the condenser here and back out the top. So make sure you've got it all set up, make sure you've got it connected and ready to turn on. Uh, make sure that the water is going to flow <laughs> where you want it to flow to, that it's exhausting to the correct position. And what I like to do as soon as the still is charged is just turn it on and make sure it's actually working. The cooling water is turned on and I like to do a little sanity check of just touching the condenser and you know making sure that it's yes in fact it is cooler than the rest of the column it's cooler than ambient temperature I know it's working make sure that nothing is leaking and that the water is exhausting where you want it to go depending on the size of your still and uh, water restrictions or you know how much you pay for water in your area you might want to turn this off again for a little while until the still is actually ready to start producing and of course, you want to have something ready to actually collect into. And right down there, I have a big old pot that I'm going to transfer these glasses into. That's my T500 still. You uh, never have enough large stainless vessels in a, uh, in a hobby distillery. <laughs> at this point, it's also worth at least acknowledging one of the biggest no-nos in distillation, which is to never heat a completely sealed vessel. Heating something that's sealed will create pressure and that's an absolute recipe for disaster with any of this sort of stuff. Now, because we're running a pot still, it is by definition an open system, right? There's nothing in this path that should be blocking it. It should never be an issue, but it is just, it, it is 100% worth getting into the practice of just mentally asking yourself, is there a chance that this is a closed system anytime you turn the still on. The still's been running for a little while and we're starting to get to the point where we need to start thinking about actually operating this thing. Uh, how do you tell that you're getting near that point? Well, you can feel the outside of the pot. It's starting to get hot. Uh, but more telling is that it's starting to warm up above the line of liquid. The long and short of it is when it actually gets hot up here at the point of no return where the vapor has to come down through the condenser you know you're right at the point where it's about to come squirting out the end uh, so what i like to do to check for that is just to touch the top of the column gently because you don't want to burn yourself uh, and then run your hand down the column to check if it's starting to get warm this is not warm at all yet it is warm down here uh, of course if you still has thermometers on it that's going to give you an indication as well when it starts getting hot around the base of the column, that's my signal to double check and triple check that the cooling water is on. So if you turned it off to save a bit of water, now's the time to turn it back on again. So our column's heating up now, it's still cool at the top, but hot about midway. Uh, and at this point in time, it's probably a pretty good idea to turn the power down a little bit. If you don't have the ability to do that, Obviously you can't, but I would suggest that having power control is the first upgrade you make to any still if you don't have it. So uh, I'm starting to get hot up to about here, so I'm just going to knock the power down to about three quarts. There's two reasons for that. One is that when it first comes up to a boil, uh, if the power's too high, that's the point where you're most susceptible to puking. Do you remember puking? We took, talked about it earlier on. Uh, number two is that especially on smaller setups like this, you run the risk of overpowering your condenser. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a little bit, uh, but if you can kind of get ahead of the game and turn the power down now, it's always easier to creep up in temperature uh, rather than suddenly be hit with a problem and have to jack it down quickly. So we're just starting to get first drips coming off the still, which is exactly what we want. It's gonna start very slowly, but it'll build speed up as it goes. 
uh, as you know all the different parts of the still start to warm up. So at this point in time we're going to monitor this closely because the first thing I want you to do is make sure that you're not overpowering your condenser. Now I've actually turned the power back up so I can show you what not to do. <laughs> do you see how my glass is starting to really fog up? There's uh, condensation all over the side of the glass and if we touch it it's hot all the way out here because there is hot vapor pouring out all over the place. We do not want that. Best case scenario is that you're just losing product and the worst case scenario is that it can kind of be a fire hazard, especially if you're using an open flame to power the still. Uh, so if it feels hot, if you're seeing a whole lot of condensation on the glass or you can literally see vapor pouring out, you need to do one of two things. First, you need to increase cooling power to your condenser if you can. And second, if that's not really an option or it's just a shorter condenser like this, we need to bring the power back down. So let me do that now. This is a collaboration with the Claw Hammer Supply guys. And let me tell you, they are absolutely freaking awesome. If you're into brewing beer at all, make sure you go over and check their channel out and subscribe to it. Awesome channel, their production quality is insane and they're doing a kick-ass job. Uh, but obviously I'm gonna be using Claw Hammer equipment here today because it just makes sense. But I did just wanna say that if you are in the market for beer brewing equipment or distillation equipment in America, especially that's where they're based, uh, it is really solid equipment and I've been using it for a long ass time. Uh, there are links in the description down below. They're not paying me to say this. <laughs> this is just a collaboration between YouTubers. Uh, but if you do end up buying their equipment, those are affiliate links, just so you know. So the power's been turned back down. There's no more hot gas, you know, hot vapor pouring out the end of the still. Uh, and the liquid itself is cool. It doesn't have to be cold. Uh, warm is okay, sort of in the vicinity of 15 to 30 degrees Celsius is where I like to aim almost all the time. All right, so now this is under control. We need to do something else really quickly as soon as the still is running. The next thing to do is to check for leaks. And the easiest way to do that is with something with a decent amount of thermal mass and is shiny. And you can just literally hold this next to all of the joints or anywhere where a leak may occur and look for condensation on the surface. So I'm just using a, um, a big old tri-clamp cover, but a little handheld mirror works wonderfully as well. So our condenser is not being overpowered, we don't have any leaks, we're up and running, and we are in fact collecting into our vessel. But it is important that you keep an eye on this. You do not want leaks, you know, large pools of uh, high ABV flammable liquid just kind of collecting in places you don't know about it. So keep an eye on this, and whenever the jar starts to get close to full, switch it out. This may sound really pedantic of me to even bother explaining, but I find the easiest way is to lift the jar that is collecting up so it's not making contact with anything. Have another jar ready and just swoop them around, pop the other one down and chances are you won't even spill a drop. Let me show you. So you might be asking yourself, uh, what about operational temperatures for the still? What about offtake speed coming off the end, what about cuts, all of those sorts of things. Uh, and the, the long and the short of it is, this is the stripping run, we don't have to worry about it. But what we can do is kind of optimize efficiency here. So we turned the still down a whole lot to make sure that the uh, condenser wasn't being overpowered. And at this point, everything's up and running, we're comfortable now, we know the still's working the way we want it to work. We've got no immediate urgency on anything now. We're comfortable. What you can start to do is inch the amount of power going into the still back up again. One of two things is gonna happen. You're either gonna to get to 100% power on the still, or you're gonna start overpowering the condenser again. If you get to 100%, awesome. You're gonna run a little bit faster and spend less time doing the stripping run. <laughs> if you start overpowering the, uh, the, the condenser again, just back it off a smidge until you're happy with both the temperature uh, and the fact that there's no vapor being lost. After a little bit of fiddling around and bumping the power up, I'm uh, back up at three quarts power now. And you will notice that the deeper you go into the run, you can probably push that even a little bit further. And now you can just settle into the rest of the run. All you really need to do is keep changing those jars out. How do you know when to stop? Well, uh, when you run out of alcohol. <laughs> 
with this sort of thing, I would strongly recommend running down to at least 10% uh, coming off the, the spout. So what do I mean by that? I mean the ABV of what's literally coming off here, 10%, not the, the overall average. Uh, you can go even lower. And to be honest, I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go all the way down to about, well, like 2% today, just because uh, I want to wring every little bit out of this. That's up to you. It's just really a question of how much time and how much electricity or gas you want to use. Like I said, I would strongly recommend going down to 10% though. But you ask, how do you test what ABV a liquid is? Well, the simplest way to do it is with one of these little jobbies. It is a alchemeter. And the idea is that you just float it in a sample of the spirit you're testing. A trap that people fall into all the time when using these things is testing a spirit at the wrong temperature. These things are calibrated to be used at a specific temperature. It'll be written on the side of the instrument and it needs to be pretty close, like within a few degrees Celsius to really give you an accurate reading. Uh, also, you generally want to use a much smaller test jar than this, but I smashed mine. <laughs> anyway, other options are to use a spirit refractometer, which is one of these guys. Uh, you just put a few drips of the spirit on the lens, close it up, and have a look through here. There'll be a blue part at the top, a white part at the bottom where it changes from blue to white as we read it. And this one, funnily enough, is saying 40% ABV. Uh, there is another option, which is to use something like this. This is the Easy Dense. You take a small sample, about two mils is all it takes. Pop it into there and it connects with your phone via Bluetooth and it'll give you a readout. So right now I'm sitting at 40% ABV. We've got some more distilling to do before we shut this down and do it all over again. Once the distillation is finished, you're going to want to empty the still out. If you're just going to do this over and over again, you can just, you know, tip this on the grass, put it down the drain. However you decide to dispose of it is fine by me. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do is save some of this because you can use it for sour mashing. That is a completely different video. We'll deal with that in the future, but uh, just know that I am gonna reserve some of this to use in the future. Now the still's empty and it's time to fill it up again. Uh, a lot of people ask, how many stripping runs am I supposed to do? And the answer is basically until your fermenters are empty. There's a few little caveats there. Uh, we'll deal with that in just a second. So what's that caveat? Essentially, we don't want to run the still where there's a chance where the element in the bottom of the still will end up running itself dry. What I'm saying is just make sure that you have enough liquid coming out of the fermenter into the still. So once the, the, the volume that we take out through distillation is taken out, the element is still going to be fully submerged. For a stripping run, you might take out a third of the volume, maybe. That's probably pushing it. So with the still filled back up again, we're just going to run it exactly the same way as we did the first time. We're going to bring it up to temperature, ensure that we've got cooling running through the condenser. Uh, we're going to make sure that there's no leaks or anything like that. Ensure that it's running safely. Uh, check that it's coming off in the correct way and collect everything that comes out the other end. And we're just going to repeat this process until all of our wash is distilled. Next day, the still has been cleaned out. I gave it a quick rinse out with the hose just to get any of the little chunky bits out of there. And here we have the results, everything we collected from all of our stripping runs. In this case, I did two. Uh, this spirit is called the Low Wines. And actually, let's test it and see what ABV we're at. This is 25% ABV. And that's probably the range sort of between 20 to 30 percent ABV that you're going to be sitting in if you did collect down nice and low coming off uh, the still for the stripping runs. Now all of this can go into uh, our still again. I want all of the drips. <laughs> we worked hard to make this stuff, I'm not going to waste it. 
All right, uh, now, if you come and have a look over here, you're gonna see a wee problem. Our element is still exposed in the still. So generally speaking, when you're making something for pot distillation, double pot distillation, you wanna make roughly three times what you can fit into the still, three to four times uh, in terms of wash. So if you have a five gallon still, you're gonna make 15 to 20 gallons of wash. If you have a 10 gallon still, you're gonna make 30 to 40 gallons. I think you get the idea. That is gonna ensure you don't run into this problem here. Uh, if you do get to this point, you've got a couple of different ways of fixing it. Number one, if you have a hunch that you're going to run into this problem, you can reserve a little bit of the wash from your fermenters and just put that straight in there. It's going to add up in volume a lot quicker than the distillate, obviously. Uh, number two is this stuff will keep just fine. Put it into ideally a glass or a stainless steel container with a lid so it doesn't just evaporate uh, and do the whole process again. You can slowly fill up your low wines container with multiple fermentations until you have enough low wines to run the still. But if you're a YouTuber, you can use the power of video editing to solve this problem. Here's some I uh, prepared earlier. <laughs> I made another mash for exactly this reason. is up and running again we're into the spirit run guys the spirit run is the final run of the still uh, collecting the spirit that you are actually uh, going to keep so i set the still up in exactly the same way the only difference is that you've probably noticed it's running a little bit slower and that is really not a bad idea uh, to do especially when you're getting new to this essentially just running the still a little bit slower allows a little bit more natural reflux to happen in here it's going to produce a slightly cleaner spirit a slightly higher abv honestly it doesn't make a huge difference but it's better to err on this side especially when you're getting used to this uh, rather than running it too fast now the first little bit we collected we're going to call the four shots this is the stuff that comes off first and i've collected i don't know maybe 40 mils or something like that this stuff is not good for you you don't want to drink this. The nastiest stuff is more likely to come off at the beginning of the distillation. Uh, I actually like to keep this though and use it as fire lighter, degreaser, weed killer, um, you know, cleaning sticky labels off bottles and stuff like that. So uh, I keep that in a bottle, label it well and keep it separate from everything else. Now we're starting to collect heads. Heads are the initial part of the run that you do not want to uh, drink or consume as they are now. Uh, one, because they're still not great for you. They're gonna make you feel like ass if you drink this stuff. And two, they just straight up don't taste good. A lot of places will give you kind of exact measurements or temperatures or ABVs to cut at. I guess sometimes that is a good way for someone to start in the hobby, just to give them like an absolute base. I think that's kind of a trap to fall into. So I'm not gonna give you those numbers today, guys. And that is simply because it hinders your growth as a distiller and it also creates a very low ceiling in terms of the potential products you can create. So we're gonna do everything by smell, by taste and by feel. So because I don't particularly want to ingest this, I'm not gonna smell it yet. I am going to uh, feel it. It's very volatile. Uh, it feels like rubbing alcohol. And I'm gonna smell it. It smells very much the same. It smells very fumey. It smells kind of like nail polish remover. This stuff you don't want to drink. So uh, let me come back to you when it is time to actually taste the stuff. A few more minutes have passed. I've collected exactly that much <laughs> spirit. And a great way to smell this stuff, I should say too, guys, is to get a little bit on your finger, rub it in your hands, and give it a good sniff. So now the uh, straight up kind of cleaning product quality has died away a little bit and the spirit's actually kind of sweetened up, but this still isn't what we're after. It's not a grain sweetness. It doesn't taste anything really like the ingredients we put into the mash. It smells kind of like, to me, it smells like uh, changing the inner tube on a bicycle. That sweet, rubbery, uh, kind of 
a little bit sort of like stale air kind of smell. The guys at Iron Root Republic describe it as either fresh cardboard, I can totally see and understand that, or um, a really young infant uh, like milk spilly spew, that same weird sort of sweet characteristic that's slightly off. We don't want this either, so keep on running straight past that. You can at this stage if you want to give it a little taste. Um, I'm relatively used to tasting high ABV spirits, so I do it just like that. If you're new to this, I would not suggest doing that. You're gonna blow your palate out and you're not gonna taste anything for the rest of the day. Instead, what you can do is just use teaspoons. So put a teaspoon under the spout, collect half a teaspoon coming off the still, give another half teaspoon of water and give that a taste. The taste is very similar to the smell. It's still that weird, stale, slightly off sweetness flavor. We don't want it, so we're gonna keep running heads for now. Once you get past that weird, sweet, cardboardy, rubbery phase, you're gonna to get to one other phase that we don't wanna keep, and that is a weird, bitter, astringent kind of flavor that is just not pleasant. <laughs> and you really can't, oh well, I can't smell this so much, I have to taste it. And that is a, it's kind of somewhere between bitterness and astringency. It just sits funny on your mouth. It, 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 it just sits funny on your tongue. It's kind of piercing. Uh, it's, it's just not pleasant to drink. You can get some other weird flavors in here as well. It can be slightly soapy. Uh, it can be kind of menthol-y or eucalyptus-y, depending on exactly what it is you're distilling. Uh, but once again, we just wanna wait this out and make sure we're not collecting this as hearts. But uh, remember guys, you need to be onto it in terms of switching your cut jars out as well. Don't forget that. Eventually, you'll notice that uh, bitter, astringent, sort of harsh flavor in your mouth starting to fade, and you'll start to notice the flavors of the things that are actually in that recipe, the corn, the barley, the wheat, starting to rise up. When that starts to happen, you know you're getting very close to switching over to heart. So what I would suggest people at home do, if this is your first time doing this or you're new to it, is to start collecting Maybe three jars at just very small volumes like this, just little bits. And I'm gonna show you over at the bench why we do that. So here we have everything I've collected off the still so far, starting with our four shots here, definitely heads here, probably heads here, and sort of transitioning right around here where I think that bit of astringent flavor is starting to fade away. The reason I recommend doing it this way for a beginner or a distiller who is even just distilling a new ingredient is that it can be really hard to make decisions on the fly coming off the still in real time. Collecting it in jars like this allows you to kind of step back and make decisions without being rushed. It's also kind of difficult to actually taste and smell the differences I've been talking about so far when you're not used to this kind of thing when you haven't done it before. Uh, I remember when I started it kind of just all tasted like Bernie. <laughs> So I can jump around and smell and taste in comparison with each other, rather than trying to carry a specific flavor in your head that you haven't even tasted or smelt yet. That can be pretty freaking difficult. So to run through what we've done so far, four shots, like I said, I'm just gonna put those in a container uh, and use it for fire lighter or whatever. Heads, definitely heads, we know that's heads. This hasn't got any of that rubbery sweet cardboard flavor, but it is quite bitter and astringent and very prickly on the mouth. This one, hmm, let me give it another go. This one's borderline actually, uh, but I'm not gonna keep it. I'm gonna move it over here. And this, yeah, I'm calling that hearts. I'm gonna keep this. Now you can do your entire run in little cups like this if you want to, and that'll let you make all of the decisions on cuts later on. Uh, but uh, you can also, once you're fairly certain you're into hearts, switch over to a larger container and just collect into that, especially if you don't, uh, you know, have enough glassware. <laughs> I am not going to discard the heads though. We'll talk about what to do with this stuff once the still is finished running. So we're getting near the end of the heart cut, and I know that we're in that sort of position because the grain flavor is starting to intensify. 
uh, it's starting to be almost, how do I put it? It's starting to get a little bit more cereal-like, but also dusty at the same time. It's just getting a lot more intense. Now, this is the one time where I am gonna give you a little bit of a tip to uh, start looking out for this because it can be hard, you know, when you're new at this, I, I very much admit. I'm sitting at 63% ABV now, and I generally find I cut uh, from hearts to tails with a whiskey somewhere between 63% and 50% ABV. Now this is up to you. What do you want out of your whiskey? Do you want it to be more light uh, and approachable, delicate? You probably want to cut a little bit higher. Get rid of some of these really bold, grainy flavors out of your whiskey. Do you like a more grungy, intense, corny flavored whiskey? Go a little bit lower. But once again, to make it easy, we are going to switch back over to the smaller jars. So let me get that in there. Boop. And this can go into my, uh, can you see that? No, you can't. <laughs> can go into my uh, larger pot again. And we're gonna do exactly the same thing here on the tails. We're gonna collect maybe four or five jars, starting to get smaller in size as we go. Uh, but what I want you to look out for when you're getting down near the tails is to look out for anything that smells like wet cardboard, wet dog, um, kind of gym socky, any of those sort of flavors you really don't want in your whiskey. Stop and have a think about it though. Those flavors are very similar to grainy, dusty, cereally corn. Think um, cornflakes, like smelling a bag of cornflakes. And then smell a bag of cornflakes thinking about gym sock. It's kind of similar in some way. So switching over to the small jars and being able to assess it, you know, in individual little bits later on is gonna help us. So here we have those next few jars that I was talking about. Up here we have what was closest to the hearts. And I'm, I'm fairly sure I'm gonna keep that. Give me a minute or two just to decide. Uh, and down this end, yeah, I'm not even gonna taste it because that doesn't smell great. I'll be real, I'm not keeping that. <laughs> uh, this one, no, nah, I'm not keeping that either. And this one, hmm. borderline man all right so this is why it really is worth doing it so tasting these next to each other this fairly obviously tastes fine this is borderline uh, and to me it's just not really worth it so I'm gonna put that over into the tail section as well now back over at the still you'll notice that we're still running doesn't taste good why on earth is that uh, let me collect a little bit more of this and then we'll talk about it so I have everything on the table now that came off the still, starting with the heads that we rejected, the hearts that we decided to keep, uh, and this is the stuff that came off in the tails. Now this is the last jar of uh, hearts that I decided to keep. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not keeping that. All right, let's deal with all of this stuff first. So all of the stuff that we're not keeping, both the heads and the tails, uh, we're gonna call faints, and they can all go in together. The reason I'm keeping this stuff is next time you do a spirit run, especially, uh, that may not fit in there. I'm just gonna leave those like that. <laughs> uh, the reason we're keeping them is that next time we do a spirit run for the same type of uh, spirit, so next time I do a bourbon, these can go into that spirit run. Yes, there's a bunch of stuff in there we don't want, but because it is a pot distillation, everything's a gradient. Nothing comes off in exact fractions. It all kind of smears together. So there's also good stuff in here that we want. And if we redistill it again, it's gonna help sort of uh, separate those out even more. In other words, we can squeeze a little bit more good stuff out of this by putting it into the next spirit run. This is what is going to turn into our bourbon. But first, we need to proof it down to barrel proof. This is another point in the process where you get a little bit of artistic license. The proof that you put into the barrel, and I'm doing air quotes here for a reason, you'll see why soon, uh, determines the kinds of flavors that are going to be pulled out of the wood that we're going to use. I'll be honest with you guys, maturation or aging is a part of the process that is kind of, I mean, it's totally science, but there is definitely an artistic and kind of just a, 
magic aspect to it as well. So everything I say here is a generalization and it's not gonna happen every time. But the range of ABV we're looking for for barrel maturation is between 50% ABV and about 65% ABV. If you're at 50% ABV, obviously you've got more water in there. And if you're at 65% ABV, you've got less water. Why do I tell you this? Because water and alcohol are going to pull different flavors out of the wood. Down closer to 50% ABV, you're pulling out more uh, wood sweetness. It's gonna be mellower over time, a little bit more of that barrel candy kind of flavors. And up towards the 65% range, you're pulling out more of the cooking spice, sort of cinnamon, uh, almond, clove, even a little bit of black pepper, definitely potentially a little bit more astringency and bitterness, uh, and just a more intense overall wood profile. Now I can't tell you what you like, you just have to have a think about it. Try a few different bourbons and see what you're into. Uh, today I'm going to be aiming further towards the, the kind of more approachable, slightly sweeter side of things, so I'm aiming for 55% ABV today. So how do you get down to that ABV? It's actually pretty simple guys, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first way is to measure the volume you have and measure the ABV you have, and there are calculators out there that'll help you with this. This is a little bit embarrassing, but the, uh, the chasethecraft.com calculators are actually currently down because I'm in the middle of switching over to a new website. <laughs> They'll be back really soon, I promise you guys. Uh, Google will help you out with that though. Search uh, proofing ABV spirit calculator just to kind of cram it with keywords. Uh, the other way is just literally to tip a little bit of water into the spirit and measure it. Now the problem with this is depending on how your, this is my water by the way. <laughs> the problem is depending on how you're measuring your ABV, uh, you need to be aware that as you add water, this is actually going to warm up. And if you're using a technique that is uh, based on being calibrated to a certain temperature, you're probably gonna push outside that temperature as you do it. I just mentioned that because it's another one of those traps that people fall into a lot. Uh, so, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm actually feeling kind of lazy today because my measuring jug is full of, um, well, it's full of tails. <laughs> so I'm just gonna measure this, take a wee sample, and I'm gonna use this little doodad to tell me what ABV we're at. You guys are gonna know what it's at before me. Okay, we're at 70% ABV, which is pretty typical for a run like this. And what did I say? I was going for 55% ABV, right? Now, if you are doing it this way, guys, always, always, always add like way less water. Than you think you're going to need because you can always add a little bit more. You can't take it out again. 57%. <laughs> so I was uh, flying a little close to the sun there, to be honest. Let's go with a little more. That's probably gonna about do it, I think. I overcooked it. That's why you shouldn't use this method. <laughs> it's gone to 52.4, but I'll be honest with you, I'm actually totally fine with that. All right, we've got one last step to getting this thing well on its way to becoming bourbon. Uh, so let's head back over to the bench there and I'll show you what it is. All right, team, the last part of the puzzle, maturation. This is make or break time. What is it? Essentially maturation or aging is uh, putting your spirit either onto or into oak or wood uh, and over time it is going to evolve and change. There's chemical processes that happen to the spirit itself, it's going to evolve over time. You're also going to get flavour out of the wood and colour out of the wood itself and you're also going to get uh, precursors out of the wood that contribute to or aid or enable other chemical processes to literally transform flavors as well. Basically what I'm trying to tell you here is there's a little bit of magic. <laughs> it's all science, it's all chemistry and physics, but it's a little bit of magic as well. Uh, there is a bunch of things out there for fast aging, and in my experience they can be interesting, they can sort of help you tell what might happen to a spirit over the long run, but at the end of the day, there's really no substitute for time. 
Time is your best friend when it comes to making a quality bourbon. Okay, so what options do you have? Now you could uh, put spirit into a barrel like this. This is a bad mode barrel. There'll be links in the description down below. Uh, you could use these smaller barrels like this as well. That's entirely oak. Both of those are solid options. Uh, the downside here is cost for the barrel. It can be kind of expensive. Uh, and also you're gonna need to make more wash, more spirit to really fill those. Uh, so what are we gonna be doing today? Today, we are going to be putting our spirit into a glass jar. I like to use these little flip top glass jars simply because I can buy them at Kmart for a very reasonable price. Uh, and they do have a silicon gasket, which I don't entirely trust. So I wrap the gasket, this part here, in PTFE tape just to stop contact with the silicon itself. And also, uh, when you seal it, it becomes not quite entirely airtight or watertight. Uh, and I think a small amount of gas exchange in and out of here is good. We want a little bit of oxidation over time. What about the wood? Uh, you can use all sorts of different kinds of wood. Uh, American white oak is what you want to use if you're making a bourbon. Uh, but there's all sorts of different kinds of oaks that you can use. People use uh, wood from fruit trees and all sorts of different things. That's all legitimate, but for today we're keeping it traditional and we're using US white oak. It is also important to use uh, oak that has been aged or seasoned. Very important, that's a whole nother topic. Just know that it's a thing. Uh, so today I'm gonna be using the Chase the Craft staves, which will be available soon <laughs> on the website. I'm working on it guys, I promise. Um, and I have toasted these at 160 degrees Celsius for 45 minutes. And then I've given it a charring with a blowtorch. That is gonna go in there. Oh my God, there's a fly in there already. Get the fly out. <laughs> and seal it up. How long is it gonna take in there? And honestly guys, the answer is as long as it needs to take. If you wanna make something that is really nice, you're looking at years. Two years would be a solid uh, thing to aim for, I think. Uh, if you want to do it faster, yes, you can add more oak in there. Um, it's going to give more oak flavor faster, but it's not going to give you the complexity that age will. So I'm going to put one of these in there and I'm going to taste this again at about six months, see how it's doing. Maybe I need to take this oak stave out and split it. It's starting to get a little bit too tannic, a little bit too uh, astringent or spicy or peppery. But I think that's going to be pretty solid uh, for at least a year as is. If you want to add more in, you totally can. You can put two, maybe even three staves in if you only want to age it for, I don't know, like two months. Once again, lots of oak flavor. It's basically oak tea bagging. None of that complexity. So congratulations, guys. If you've watched along all the way until now, awesome. It's a big video. I uh, appreciate you watching it this long. Make sure you drop a comment in a like in the description down below. If you followed along practically and you've actually made it to this point, congratulations, that is absolutely awesome. Welcome to the craft. Uh, I hope you enjoy the other videos on the channel. There's plenty for you to check out. And all you need to do now is be patient for your bourbon to turn out deliciously. So do all the youtube -y things, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, drop a comment in the comment section down below, and I'll catch you next time. What am I doing next time? Uh, I think it's going to be a triple distilled Irish whiskey. <laughs> See you later, guys.